So as all IITians, I have a cheat sheet. And by the way, this thing worked in our exams also. So I'll just <laughs> keep it here. Uh, and of course, I can't read it in this light. But So I've got to thank you for letting me come first thing in the morning. You know, most of the talks I've given or the panels I've been in, I've been number three or number four. And you know, that sort of makes you feel like uh, Elizabeth Taylor's third husband. <laughs> it's sort of, you know what you've got to do, you just don't know how to make it interesting. <laughs> so. <laughs> so thank you, Aman, for letting me come in first this time. Uh, you know, I thought long and hard about what I was going to talk. You know, these keynotes tend to be giving gyan and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And I realized that a large part of this audience is probably smarter than me in today's technology, at least. And so technically, I have to learn from them rather than them having to learn from me. So what I'm going to do is very simply uh, define myself in a way, give you a little background of how I went through my life, and then hopefully, after this, some of you can let me know what I should do going forward. Because this technology has changed so fast, and you know, all of us sort of get lost in what we're doing at some point. So let me start. Came from a middle class background. Dad was in the army. My mother was a doctor, but a teaching medical doctor. And so that's how I had a stable life, I stayed at one place. Uh, in the 62 war, he got called up to the front my mother got a Ford Foundation fellowship to come here to the Harvard School of Public Health. So both me and my younger sister got sent to boarding schools. A year and a half later, my mom came back, and of course, they couldn't afford two kids in boarding schools, so my sister got pulled back to a day school in Delhi, and of course, she's never forgiven me for it. But uh, because I was close to my senior Cambridge, I was left at the boarding school, and I went to Doon in Dehradun, and that's where I graduated. I went to IIT Kharagpur after that, and I went to Kharagpur only because I don't know how many of you read those prospectus that comes before you apply. You know, in our days it was in paper. I just looked at all the five IITs. Everyone had electrical engineering. Kharagpur had a separate department of electronics and electrical communication engineering. So I thought there must be something different. I want to do electronics. So I ended up at Kharagpur. And that's basically why I went there. Five years at Kharagpur and, you know, again, like most people in my, my time, you start applying overseas. And I would got admission here to Stanford and to Berkeley. And my plan was very simple. Unlike a lot of my batchmates and classmates, I had pretty much decided what I wanted to do. I wanted to work for NASA, come here, do my PhD, work for NASA, and you know, do satellite control systems, you know, communication with satellites as they go deep into space. So in, when I did my electronics, computers was an option that I didn't take. I took control systems. Land up at Delhi, start working on your TOEFL, and you know, get your visa and stuff. And of course, one more thing happened. Uh, I, I decided who I wanted to get married to. She was the sister of a good friend and batchmate. And so I talked to her dad, and he said, you crazy. I can't get her married to someone who doesn't have a confirmed job. And I figured if I went to the US, I was going to take seven years before I got my PhD and could afford to go back and get married. So I took probably the biggest decision of my life, and I think that's how I became an entrepreneur. I wrote to Stanford, they said, <coughs> excuse me, they said they'd defer my admission, and I could apply for aid again the next year, which I thought I'd get. And uh, so I applied for a job, and that's a long story too, but I ended up getting a job as a senior management trainee in DCM. So got confirmed in a year, got married in 15 days after that. <laughs> and when you meet my wife in the afternoon, just tell her, best decision of my life. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, what happened right after that was, so I was ready to check it up and come here. DCM decided to, and DCM was the fourth largest private company in the country at that time, uh, 250 crore turnover. Uh, they decided to get into electronic calculators. And there weren't too many electronic engineers in the company. So the executive director of that division called me and said, you're going to head national sales and marketing and service and you know a few other things. And I thought to myself, one year out of college, where am I going to get this opportunity? So I said, let me stay here and try this out for a while. 
uh, which you know happened. So I kept my admission open for six years. Then they said you got to do your GRE again. I said hey, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so you know we did a fairly well. We had a big market share in calculators. It was a small division, but profitable. And then we made we made programmable calculators, and then we made uh, microprocessor. Not really microprocessor, but we made uh, bit slice based computers. And uh, said, hey, let's take it to the market. Because IBM and ICL uh, were selling really junk. They were selling old machines, 1401s, 360s, stuff like that in the market. Unfortunately, India was a socialist country. And there was an act called the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act. And DCM, being a large company, was not allowed to get into a new field. We tried to argue that. You know, programmable calculators, computers, I mean, you call it a programmable calculator, but it's actually a computer. You write a program. But, you know, if you worked for a large company and you ever talk to their legal and admin, their job is to tell you how you can't do things. I don't, you know, that's been my ex simple experience in that one company. So we, I mean, I was 25 years old. Most of us were that age. Uh, some were younger, actually. I was the older person in that group. Uh, we all decided that you couldn't, don't see the end of your career at 25. So we said, hey, if these guys don't realize the power of microprocessors, let's go out and do it ourselves. Now, we've got to remember, no business plan, no money, just that I know the market. I know this technology is going to change the world. I have this gut feeling. So let's go out and do it. And so in my grandmother's, not really garage, my grandmother's Barsati, uh, we sat down and said, put our money together. We had a lakh and 75,000. And uh, started, said, we don't have the money. You know, we got to invest in R&D to develop computers. So let's sell calculators, which is something we know to do this. And of course, uh, you know, uh, we started Microcomp, it was called, in October 75. In uh, August 76, uh, our computer was ready. Uh, we then realized you need a license to manufacture computers. And licenses were reserved for all state or public, uh, or public or state sector companies. So we signed a joint sector agreement with UP Electronics Corporation. And because we wanted, we thought people who buy computers buy them from solid companies. So we called it Hindustan Computers Limited. Paid a fair amount of money to get the name Hindustan. But then it was easy to make people believe that this is a brother of Hindustan Machine Tools, Hindustan Aeronautics. <laughs> you know, it's. <laughs> it, it really helped. And the fact that we were a joint sector company, not too many people understood what joint sector meant. It meant that we had 26% share, the government had 20, uh, we had 25%, government had 26, and 74 was public. But our total equity was 20 lakhs. So the cost of going public was more than what we would have got. So we ended up owning indirectly 74% of the company when we started. But you know, joint sector with UP Electronics Corporation made people think it was government. Also, the, and we first came out with our first programmable calculator. And again, that's a long story. I don't have the time. But the good news was when we announced our 8-bit microprocessor in India, and I've got to mention that we announced it in the same month and year as which Apple announced the Apple one here in the US. So, you know, in a way, in hindsight, I'm very proud of it that we were able to do it in that time frame. <clears throat> but the day we took out an ad, a full page ad in all the national newspapers, the headlines were that IBM and Coke were leaving India. And so in people's minds, somehow we were the replacement for IBM. And that obviously helps if it's in their mind, then you try and reinforce it without really reinforcing it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, those are the breaks that always help. And as I said, you know, when you, the way you've got to live your life is you're dealt a set of cards. You, that, those are the ones you've got to play with. You can't keep asking for a joker. It doesn't always happen. And so basically, those are the breaks you get. So HCL worked fine. You know, we did a lot of things. In fact, uh, I've got to tell you, when we made our first 8-bit machine, the way we worked in those days, we took 30% advance because that covered our bill of materials. And then when the guy came with the check for 70%, we cut a ribbon and we were going to deliver it from the factory. And you know, computers were a big thing. Our first machine, the guy came, he had the check ready. And we were going to take it out of the factory when one of our, someone in the company said, have you paid your excise? And said, yeah, what is this excise? 
And they said, you know, there's a production tax in India. If you make anything, you got to pay a production tax. So we called the excise guy and said, what is my excise? Is it by weight? Because transformers were four hours a kilo by weight. <laughs> or is it ad volerum, which is on the value of the equipment, a percentage of the value? So he looked through his whole book, and he said, there's no microprocessor base, there's no computer, there's no category for this, so I don't know what to tell you. So we said, what do we do? So he said, look, go to your administrative ministry, have them write to the finance ministry, then the finance ministry will issue a notification, and then you can pay that amount and take it out. I said, this crazy, this will take three, four months. I've got to deliver the machine. He said, no, no, this is revenue generating for the government. It happens in one day. I said, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so the Department of Electronics had just been started. And because they thought electronics was the future in India. And so we go to DOE and give them this full presentation and tell them what we're doing and say, please write to the Ministry of Finance. And they look at us and say, you know, the microprocessor policy has still not come out. We expect it to take four years. So please come back four years later. <laughs> and then we'll write that letter. So here, are, think about it. You've got this machine ready. You've got customers who paid you advance. They're willing to pay you the balance. You bought all the parts. So this one was Saturday, we used to work half day Saturday in India in those days. The government used to work second and third or second and fourth or something like that. But whatever. So we go home very depressed. Everyone takes this uh, excise book home, said, let's have a look at it again in carefully. And then you discover, you know, import substitution was a big thing in India because they wanted to try and save dollars. So anything that got imported, automatically they set up a code for it in the excise manual. And so there was this uh, electromechanical accounting machines from Robotron accounting machines that came from East Germany. And they had a photograph with a keyboard, a small display, and a printer. And so we showed it to the excise guy. And we showed him our machine. He said, ah, it's the same thing. <laughs> so, so for four years, we actually excised our machines out as accounting invoicing machines. We even sold one to the Department of Electronics, by the way. <laughs> you know, it did take four years. That. So, you know, I just wanted to give you an idea. That was the kind of environment we worked with in India at that time. I mean, it was a lot of fun. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, we always had an ambition that we'd be a global company rather than an Indian company. We didn't want to be a big fish in a small pond. We wanted to be a small fish in a big pond. And so in 1980, I think it was, we actually went to Singapore and said, let's manufacture our computers in Singapore. We were actually the first computer company to do that. We got pioneer status with the Singapore government. And the model was not to sell computers, but to sell solutions. So what we do is we check what the customer wanted. We would tell our people, and we set up an office in Madras, because Madras and Singapore had three flights a week. And it was a three and a half hour flight. And basically, we would programmed the application. And that would be delivered with the computer so that you sold a solution, not just a box. Now, and this is an interesting story about Spick McKay. What happened was that this soft SED, as we called it, software export division in Madras, was software was not treated as an industry. It was treated as a trade. So we came under the Shops and Establishments Act, not the Companies Act. And the Shops and Establishments Act asked you to keep lots of registers and all sorts of stuff, which we just weren't used to. You know, and so we were lobbying with the Tamil Nadu government to try and change it as software should be an industry, not a trade. Now, in the meanwhile, Spick McKay, and by the way, the guy who runs Spick McKay is not me, it's Kiran Seth, who's a batchmate, a friend from IIT Kharagpur. And uh, long story how it started, but uh, we used to, initially he wanted to publicize it, and I had a massive advertising budget in HCL. So I used to give him small one-inch one ads on the third page of all major newspapers when he had a function. And we'd say, uh, you know, sponsored or whatever by Hindustan Computers Limited. So, and I mean, I used to do that on my own. I hadn't taken clearance or anything from anyone in the company because we had such a massive budget. One day, Shivnada, who's our chairman, comes to me and he says, what's this picnic? 
And I said, oh shit, oh chori pakdi gai na, so kind of thing. <laughs> so I asked him, why do you want to know? He said, he said, you know, we've got a clearance for software as an industry. Said, how did that happen? He said, these guys from Tamil Nadu, these bureaucrats from Tamil Nadu saw this ad, which was sponsored by Hindustan Computers Limited. He said, you know, if you're doing this kind of thing, the company must have a soul. So we'll take your word for it. <laughs> and, you know, it's, but, you know, it's funny to see how Spick Mickey was responsible for getting software, which is now, I think, 10% of our GDP established or recognized as an industry rather than as a trade. And so, you know. And, So 10 years, and I have time here, 10 years after I started HCL, I had what I think some of you may understand, it's called a midlife crisis. I thought, you know, what am I doing? I always wanted to do a PhD. I've sort of given up my technical thing by and large. There's nothing much I'm doing. And so, and of course the company had grown large. What had happened is to get a circular to the last guy would take one month because we're all over the country. And, uh, you know, there were crazy days. You didn't have phones. So what you ended up doing, you remember ISD PCOs? Yes. So we used to always keep our service office in a remote place near an ISD PCO. And then we'd take a wire from there and string it all the way to our office. So we had a phone. You know, that's technically how we serviced from some 2,000 locations in India when we were growing up. But yeah, it, I wasn't having fun. So I thought, you know, let me take three months off, go to Missouri you know, meditate for a while and then decide what to do. Fortunately, I got good advice from my other co-founders. And they said, look, that's not the way. You'll still be as confused three months later. <laughs> so why don't you go do a course somewhere? And so I came here to the Harvard Business School for a 13-week course called the Advanced Management Program. And I think that cleared up my head because what I realized was that I didn't really enjoy running a big company. I, I missed the fun of a startup. And so when I went back, I said, I don't want my old job back. I don't want to run HCL sales. I want to start everything new. Anything new that we are doing, I want to do that. And so the board said, great, but you can't only do what you want to do. So the deal was that anything new I would do, but if any division went into a problem, that would be my problem too. So I had to do the turnarounds as well as something new. And so I had probably had the greatest couple of years of my life. We started a division called CAD-CAM, and uh, for, we sold engineering solutions. I think uh, I used my engineering for the first time in a real situation, rather than just talking a RAM, ROM, you know, all that kind of stuff, when you were trying to educate people as to what computers were. In fact, uh, when talking about RAM and ROM, I remember I was called once to give a a Punjabi definition of what a computer was to the chief minister of Punjab. Yani, uh, I think, I forget, no, Zayal Singh or Darwara Singh or some. And so, you know, you can't ram, rom, uh, you know, memory, I mean, how the hell do you say it in Punjabi? <laughs> so, <laughs> so after a while, I sort of decided, look, best thing is, why do you want to know? What are you going to use the computer for? And I've got to tell you, amazing, uh, it's CRM today, but amazing application. He said, you know, when an MLA gives me uh, his, uh, when he walks in through that door to see me, he starts yelling from the door that I ask you for favors, you never do anything for me, this time you've got to do it. And he said, I'm always on the defensive. He said, what I want you to do is, anytime someone asks me for a favor, I want it entered in the computer, I want to track the guy that I got him a job in customs and he misbehaved himself, so he was thrown out after three months, <laughs> or whatever. So he said, when the guy walks in yelling, I want to go to the computer, feed it in, and turn around and say, look, you asked me for five favors, I did this, 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 all those guys turned out to be duds, I'm not going to do anything more for you. <laughs> Great application, I thought. Right? And of course, you know, since I'm talking about applications, we had a small customer. Those days, computers used to cost a lot. I mean, our 8-bit uh, machine used to cost 3,64,100 and came with two built-in solutions. So there was this small company, really small company, called Hilton Rubber in Connaught Place. And he placed an order with Advance for this computer. So I thought I better go meet him because you don't want a bad reference and stuff. So I go to this guy and say, you know, like, in a polite way, I don't say it that directly, why are you spending so much money to buy this computer? What are you going to do with it? 
And so he said, look, basically, I compete with Dunlop and Madras Rubber Factory and all these MRF and all these people, and I have 200 customers. I just want to make sure my 200 customers stay with me. And so what I want is, I will give you the data that this customer, his wife's name is this anniversary, this birthday, this kid's name is this, he has his coffee black with one sugar, he likes this Chinese food or whatever. I'll give you all the data, just put it in. When that guy comes to see me, I want to check this before he comes. So I give him his coffee exactly the way he wants. I order the right Chinese food, the right dish that he likes, et cetera, et cetera. Again, CRM, if you look at it in today's language. You know, I think a month or so after we delivered, I'd gone to see him. He told me the computer's paid for itself. He said, none of my 200 customers are going to move anywhere, right? Hey, that's what. So it's amazing what people did with these computers in the old days. Yep, so midlife crisis, I went back. Uh, we ran into a problem here at HCL America. We came here to sell hardware to, in the US. We had a big order. The order went south because the company got bought by SCI out in Texas. And SCI wanted Intel only, and we were Motorola 68,000 based. So I was sent here, and the person handling this went in for a bypass, and those days bypasses weren't common. So I was sent here to make sure he didn't overstrain himself and to shut down the company uh, quietly because we'd taken a lot of mileage saying, brain drain, HCL computers go to the US and all that kind of stuff. So when I came here, <laughs> basically uh, we had people sitting in uh, the uh, enabling technology companies, databases, compilers, porting them into a multiprocessor machine that, we had, that was unique and that we had made uh, running Unix. And uh, the, the deal we had with these companies was we'll give you the engineers at our cost, the IP is yours, but let them do the extensions to your software so that they work efficiently on our machine, or porting them on our multiprocessor machine. So when we decided to get out of hardware, I sent a note to all these people saying I'm pulling out my people. Everyone said they'd pay for it because they needed those multiprocessor extensions. And technically that's how we started what was called HCL America. That's how I got a cash flow. I was cash positive the day we did that because everyone paid me a fair amount per hour for my engineers. And uh, you know, HCL America then morphed into what we today know as HCL technologies. It's what, 120,000 people. Uh, I don't know, I don't even know the revenue. I know the market cap. <laughs> but, they're <laughs> but they're doing pretty well, yeah. So I went back to India in 96. So when I started the company, my basic idea was, why am I doing this? I had a kid. I said, I'm doing it because I want to, be, I want to have the economic freedom to do what I want to do. And I didn't know what I wanted to do at that time. So now I was turning 50. I said, I've got the economic freedom. What do I want to do? And I wanted to play on the internet, at the edge of the internet as it was coming out, not wait for it to stabilize and then, you know, uh, just be at the edge of technology. And so I decided to step out and retire from HCL. It, again, I think it's a major achievement. It took me a year and a half, and I did an amicable exit, which doesn't happen too often in India, at least. And then my retirement lasted I think 10 days. I was at home, you know, working, and my wife sat me down and said, you know, this house has run without you for 27 years. She also said, look, I married you for good or bad, but I didn't marry you for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and said, I'll pay for a business center for my budget. Please go and work for a business center. Don't work from home. So bottom line, ended up business center, met some other old HCL guys decided, look, uh, you know, the model was, you know, we, we wanted to do a different model, said, where the industry going to go, the services industry going to go in 10 years? And we said, look, it's going to be domain focused. It's not going to be, give me a Unix C programmer or whatever the hell you had, but you're going to have to talk domain with the customer. You've got to show value add. You've got to discuss the business problem and then give, use IT to give the solution, not just give a project manager who doesn't understand the jargon of the business. And so we said, okay, if that's the company we want to form, let's set it up and start it that way. And so that's how we started TechSpan in, uh, I think, end of 98. Uh, of course, what happened in 99, you hit the bubble, so you forgot all your strategic thinking, 
and said, hey, let's just do e-commerce. And we grew phenomenally, actually. Did uh, 14 million, 15 million in our first year. Did uh, 74 million in our second year, which is calendar 2000. The reason we survived was we made a profit. And people were discounting us to buy us or take us public because we were profitable. I don't know how many of you remember those days. And so we didn't go public, which is why we survived. And then, of course, the slowdown hit. And uh, I mean, I was tied up. My dad wasn't well. He passed away late in August 2001. But uh, I wasn't spending too much time here. So when I came back, we decided that in the services business, standing still doesn't help. So we did an interesting thing. We said, look, this slowdown is going to go away sometime. Let's keep our cash flow neutral. And we didn't lose money any month from a cash flow point of view, except for 9-11, that particular month, yes. But what do we do? So we did, a, did something which we called asset light. So we said, let's focus on the capital markets, the investment banks in New York. And everyone had laid off. And let's talk domain, which is what our strategy was. So we'd go to these bars and meet with people who are laid off and talk to them and you know whatever. And then Goldman would say, look, I need someone in municipal bonds. And I remember talking to some guy from Morgan Stanley who'd been laid off who came from municipal bonds. So we'd talk, catch that guy and tell him, come with us for this call, a pre-sales call. And if they like you and give us the job, I'll give you a job. So it was asset light till you got the <laughs> job. And it really worked because we got some people placed, we got some revenues, and there were nice revenues. And when the markets came back, the people who didn't get jobs felt, and they all go back, it's an incestuous setup, that uh, Wall Street. So they all went into JP Morgan or wherever, but they remembered that we tried to help them. And so they all called us and said, hey, I'm here, can I help you guys in some way? And so that's how we grew headstrong uh, from, I think we were 30 odd million to about 200 million when we sold it to Genpact for 550 million in uh, what is it, May 2011. So again, I thought this time I didn't make the mistake. I hadn't planned my retirement. And uh, so I didn't retire. Uh, we were looking to acquire some companies which we didn't acquire in Headstrong. So I went and worked with them because I thought they had potential. Uh, got a couple of them sold. And right now I'm actually working, I mean, I'm advising a number of startups, but two that I'm actively working with. One is a education content company in the K-12 that's moving into higher ed right now. And the other one's a really interesting healthcare company that uh, is doing rural telemedicine for poor folk in India, where we charge 100 rupees to get them connected to a doctor and get advice from a regular doctor at a regular hospital. And that's sort of keeping me busy. Startups tend to how should I put it, tend to keep you busy because first of all, you're working with completely new people. They've never done startups before, helping them how to scale, how to set up things, how to do things, I think. So that's what I'm doing right now. As my wife says, I'm busier now than I was when I was the CEO of Headstrong. And I keep telling her I had a team then, I don't have a team now. And of course, you don't help unless you give me a sandwich for lunch. But <laughs> but yeah, that's so that that's where I am right now. I thought I'd uh, you know, give you that background so you can help me tell me what I should be doing as we go forward. I was telling uh, Aman that I'll do an anti-keynote instead of, you know, giving you Gyan, I would look for Gyan from you. But that's what I've done. It's been a simple life. I've, I've just followed my cards. I mean, you're dealt a set of cards. I mean, you always have a, what's with you and just take advantage of any opportunity or crisis that comes up, you know, and that's, that's really how I look at life, that, hey, I'm not smarter than anyone, I'm not better, I try to work harder, doesn't always work, but you know, that's basically what it is. And I'd be happy, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arjun, for your talk. Uh, I guess if there are questions, we can take maybe one or two. I would like to invite Aman to give you a gift and um, maybe Maybe you can take one question while Aman is walking up. Hi. Uh, I mean, uh, it was very interesting to talk. Like, I mean, it was excellent, like, because you worked in an environment where, you know, there was uh, still a protected environment, like uh, the government protections and all this kind of uh, system. And uh, it, it is still there, like, in a lot of places, like, especially for a company like ours, like, which is trying to kind of solve traffic congestion problems and, you know, road uh, safety issues. 
uh, which are essentially government owned around the world right now. Uh, but a lot of the VCs kind of are sh shoving us away, like, or kind of not willing to work. What advice would you have, like, on how to raise money, or how did you guys raise money to kind of, you know, build computers in those days, like, essentially, as a small startup? One lakh seventy-five thousand. With that, did you were you able to build uh, systems in those days, like, essentially, or how did you bootstrap yourself? No, we just those days you could, when you had parts, you could get, a, uh, you could discount them sixty percent or so with the banks. So the banks, without realizing it, were the VCs in our time, and they were happy to get the interest. Basically, that's how it worked. We didn't actually, till we went public some 20 years later, we didn't get any money from outside. It was all generated internally. Would, would uh, that be of interest to you to kind of advise a startup who's trying to tackle much more challenging problems like you tackled in those days, like, <laughs> you know, rather than just uh, social ventures right now? <laughs> you know, I can tell you something that living and breathing cash flow. 80% of your life for 20 years is not a very pleasant thing. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to go through that again. But, uh, yep, yep. We can talk. Uh, it, it, but it's fun. It's fun. And the other thing I've got to tell you, in all fairness, uh, one reason why the industry survived and why we survived, because government uh, regulatory cycles were annual. They had an annual budget where they would change things around. Uh, computer technology cycles were quicker than annual. So they were always regulating what we didn't need which was really nice, right? So we never really got regulated per se once we got into the business. I'll give you a great example. You know, the banks uh, uh, didn't want to get into computers because, you know, computers, people will get out of jobs, the unions are very strong. So it took us many, many years to actually come to an agreement with the banks and them with the unions. And we never sold them computers. They were called, they were PC-80s, but they were called advanced ledger posting machines. Right, that seemed to be the way acceptable. And so the country impaneled two companies. They impaneled us at HCL, and they impaneled a small company called Usha something, which was not the Usha Shriram group, but the Vinay Rai group in Delhi. And we got 60% of the business, and they got 40% of the business. So after they bought 2080s, the bank said, pause, let's do a check and see what we're doing and how they are progressing, and then we'll look at the next order. Now, what happened was we have obviously had other markets we sold to, but Usha had decided only to sell to the banks. So they pretty much went under because they had no other customers. They had only these parts for the 80s which they got for the banks. Now, when the, uh, when the government opened it for the banks, DRAM's duty was 25%, right? When the banks stopped buying, the next year the government kicked up their duties to 140% on imported DRAMs. Usha made a killing selling their DRAMs in the market because they'd imported them at 25%. And they had them sitting in stock as dead stock for a year. And then they sold them at that higher price because the price of the DRAMs in the market had gone up. And so sometimes when you sat in India, you got frustrated because, hell, I'm working so hard and trying to make profit. And here's someone who just played the system in a way without really knowing whether he played it, knowing it or not, I have no idea. But yeah, that, that was the market in those days. So fortunately, that doesn't exist to a large extent today because most of that regime has been disbanded. Yeah, we can talk about that later, but yeah, sure. Yeah, thank please. You. Uh, thank you so much, Arjun. I'll invite Aman to give you a gift. Thanks, Aman. Thank you. Arjun, this is a handcrafted IIT Bay Area pen, okay? So yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Arjun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.